It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 66, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Sean Yodnicek manages the Clemson Student Organic Farm at Clemson University. Six acres of produce, serves a 100-share CSA, wholesale markets, and a farmer's market, in addition to providing a home for graduate student research. Sean is also the author of the new book, The Bio-Integrated Farm, a 21st century manual for enhancing farms with practical, permaculture-based design elements. Sean shares his experience and insights into creating the optimum farm layouts, including road placement and bed structure, creating drainage patterns that enhance the farm's biological functioning, and using ponds to increase light and heat in the greenhouse. We also dig into the Clemson Student Organic Farm's other strategies for temperature management in the greenhouse, including supplementing greenhouse heat with external compost piles. In addition, we explore the Clemson Student Organic Farm strategies for weed control and soil health, including the use of crimp cover crop no-till and additional mulch materials to create season-long weed control, and cover cropping on raised beds. And Sean shares how he has structured the CSA to function in a campus environment, managing customer needs as well as adapting to a high turnover, low work hour student labor force. Plus, we get a great tutorial on gopher control. I learned a lot from this interview, and I enjoyed the ways that Sean talks about big ideas and practical details. I hope you enjoy it, too. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high-quality compost and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by FarmFan. Ever wish you could text a reminder to all of your customers? FarmFan does just that, increasing market turnout and sales week after week. FarmFanApp.com or see farmer to farmer podcastcom slash sponsors for 25% off your 6 or 12 month subscription. Sean Yadnicek, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer Podcast. Thanks for having me here. This is an honor. Great. I'm so glad you could be on the show today. Um, I'd like to start off with having you tell us a little bit about the Clemson University Student Organic Farm. Yes, we are a six-acre certified organic farming operation, which is right on the campus of Clemson University. And we host classes, workshops. Um, I employ students who work at the farm. Our main market's a uh, 100-share CSA operation. And we also have wholesale markets that we sell to you. Um, and then we have grad students doing research and a whole host of fun, exciting projects that we're working on. And that six acres, does that does that encompass the research and the production side of things? Yeah, we do research and production on the six acres, and we just acquired another three acres that, that we're just doing um, strictly research on right now. We're, we're looking at uh, different cover cropping planting dates and using those cover crops for organic no-till. So we're looking at um, planting the cover crops at different dates, and then we're looking at um, rolling and crimping them at different dates as well. And and you mentioned the 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 no-till research. I mean, you guys are in South Carolina. What's the what's the weather like in South Carolina? Uh, or maybe I should ask, what's the climate like in South Carolina? It's really amazing, I and mean, we have a very long growing season, rainfall year round. Uh, it doesn't get much better than this. Um, our CSA operation, and we operate or we uh, distribute produce for 28 weeks out of the year. Um, but we could theoretically go year round and you can grow stuff all through the winter here, especially if you use high tunnels. But yeah, really just an amazing climate to grow vegetables in. And I guess that's a little bit of a change from where you came from in the Santa Cruz Mountains, California, at least from a moisture standpoint. Yeah, Santa Cruz was extremely difficult to grow vegetables in, believe it or not. And the biggest problem was that, I mean, it was great growing there because um, I learned a lot about irrigation and setting up irrigation systems, which is important on the East Coast as well because we can't depend upon rainfall here. But um, the main problem in the Santa Cruz Mountains was gophers. Gophers would just devastate us, and I had to spend so much time hunting and controlling gophers. And I got pretty good at it, but not having to do that frees up quite a bit of time. <laughs> I I spent my share of time uh, hunting gophers out in California too, and it's it's quite the quite the process. What was your method for doing that? Uh, I actually had a, a wonderful dog who's passed away now, but um, the dog I the dog basically used me for hunting. She would um, locate the the air vents that the gophers would make, and usually when gophers dig their tunnels, they basically piled a bunch of soil and they plug that hole, but their air vents, they leave those unplugged, 
Um, but they're very difficult to find because you don't have a pile of soil next to them. So right. she would find those air vents for me, and then I would put traps in them, plug the air hole, and then the gophers would come up and try to unclog those air vents and get trapped almost immediately, and then um, I would feed them to the dog. So she loved to eat them, and uh, she kind of hunted through me. <laughs> <laughs> sort of an uh, – is that a bio-integrated system that you had going on there? <laughs> almost, yeah. It was, it was It was pretty good. So how long have you been at Clemson University now? I've been here um, working as a as the farm manager for five years, and then previous to that, I worked as an, an extension agent in horticulture for four years. It's almost ten years now. When you got to the Clemson University Student Organic Farm, was it already a thing that was was going, or was this something that you were kind of in on the ground floor of? Um, it had been around for quite a while. I think it's been around for over ten years now. Um, when I got there, it was in desperate need of a really good design and a lot of the equipment needed maintenance. And so we basically kind of rebuilt the farm from the ground up. We moved a lot of the greenhouses, built new greenhouses, put in irrigation systems, water line, um, built produce washing sheds, built an office, a bathroom, parking areas, roads. So um, it was in need of a lot of basic infrastructure that we've, we've been able to implement over the last five years just moved my final road um, this winter. So that was one of my latest projects. But it's so important to have, you know, a good backbone and a good design for your farm. I think without a good design, it's hard to be profitable. Well, I think that's a, I mean, obviously you've got some things going on from a design standpoint as part of a student farm and as part of a university and the research operations that would be a little bit different than some of the needs you might have on a production operation. I mean, parking lots, for example, don't really fit in in a big way if you're, if you've just got a market garden and you take everything off the farm to sell, but you know, this is kind of your thing, right? This, this farm design idea and the permaculture. And was that something that you, that you arrived at the student organic farm with that already in mind, or is this something that you've kind of learned since you got there? Oh, I would say both. I mean, you know, design, I've always loved to do design and just kind of making my life easier, designing my life to be easier or making my life easier through design has been a big part of my life ever since I started growing stuff um, almost 20 years ago. So, and I've realized in that time that, you know, the better the design is, the less work you have to do. So, um, but, you know, working at the farm every day is a learning opportunity still for me. So um, I've been able to, you know, expand my design abilities and improve upon them. And, and it's such a great, um, I guess, canvas to play with at the university because I have a lot of interested students who are constantly inspiring me and pushing me to do new things. And, be more creative. And um, so we kind of feed off of each other, but it's a great atmosphere. Now you talked about, about really working with the backbone of the farm to, to change the layouts and to, you know, think about where the roads were, think about where the fields and the buildings were. When you're going into a situation like that, what, what kinds of considerations are you bringing to bear on, on the project? I guess when you're talking about buildings and infrastructure, um, greenhouses, post-harvesting sheds, offices. I guess the main goal with those is to basically keep them as close as possible together so you don't have to spend a lot of time moving between those those buildings. I think one of the main mistakes I see in farms is that they spread their buildings and everything so far out, and then they purchase you know gas-powered or electric-powered vehicles to move between the buildings. And then as you bring more employees onto your farm, then that just com compounds all the, the time it takes to move between everything. So I think one of the key factors is, you know, keeping everything as close as possible, all your core, um, all your core uh, facilities on your farm. And then as far as roads are concerned, ideally your main access roads follow the ridges in the landscape. Um, and the ridges are great because, when it rains, water just flows off those ridges. So your roads stay really dry if you put them on the ridges because water is going to flow off in, in two directions. And then if you do have to 
place of road um, in an area that isn't on a ridge, it's great to to run it across slope at a very gradual angle and then um, tie that in with water harvesting systems. But um, yeah, so if you have your access roads on your ridges, that sets up a whole pattern for field drainage. So with your road on your ridge, and then I slope the beds in the field at about a quarter percent slope. And then those beds slope to another ditch at the bottom of the field. So then when it rains, water's flowing off the roads, roads are staying dry. And then with your bed slightly sloped off those ridges, um, water's going to flow off your beds, but not flow so fast that it causes erosion. It'll flow really slowly, um, sink into the ground. But any excess water, because those beds are slightly sloped, will basically drain off. Um, and not be a problem, so you can get back into the field really quickly and um, and work it, harvest, cultivate, spray, or do whatever you need to do um, as quickly as possible after it rains. The worst thing you can do is have like low low areas in your field that collect water and create puddles where plants can't grow, and then you can't access your field as quickly. When you talk about ridge lines and and slopes and things like that. And obviously, this is a little bit of a of a balancing act between how much space you have in production, you know, in, in terms of annual vegetable production versus the design elements with, with ridges and slopes and everything. How do you balance that out? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the landforms kind of shape the design of the farm. Uh, and, you know, ridges are kind of really subtle on flat areas and we're in bottom land. But that was kind of our main limiting limiting factor where we are. It was too wet to get into the field. So redesigning the field so that we had good field drainage was kind of a critical factor to make the farm uh, productive. So, yeah, once you know the landforms and you can kind of see that, if you get a good um, contour map or uh, something that shows you the elevations in the landscape, that kind of helps you establish that pattern. But um for example, I have some areas where the fields don't drain very well, um, and those areas I've, I've turned over to um, perennial production with fruit trees and, and blackberries and stuff that, you know, aren't as critical to have a nice dry field. Um, so landforms and the drainage patterns on your farm can sometimes establish what you're growing, for sure. So I'm really interested in this because, I mean, so many farms are – are trying to carve out or maximize production from a very limited amount of acreage. You know, I'm thinking of, of some of the folks that we've talked to on the show uh, who are running, you know, urban farms or, um, I mean, even rural farms, but on a, on a very small acreage, either they don't have much to work with or they've, or they're, um, you know, they're working with an odd shaped piece of ground. That's, that's kind of the, the piece that they're stuck with. How do you balance all that out? I mean, you know, when you talk about like turning, I, I'm thinking of my own farm and I'm thinking like the wet spot that we had in our field that was maybe a quarter to a third of an acre. It really wasn't enough to actually go out and, and start another enterprise with, you know, say a blackberry enterprise or a fruit tree enterprise. What what other options are there for for dealing with those water issues? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, if you have a wet area, you can always turn it into a pond. Um, but yeah, it takes, I mean, getting good field drainage has taken about five years, and I'm down to like my last wet spot at this point. But um, it's a slow process every time I, I'm tilling a field and, and preparing it. I do a little bit of field grading. Um, you could spend millions of dollars hiring a contractor to do the grading for you, but I just use a box scraper. Um, Basically, as I'm digging the ditch at the bottom of the field that um, collects the, the field runoff, I use soil from digging that ditch to fill in any low areas in the field. And then also use the box scraper to pull soil. It takes a lot of time to move soil around, so you have to be efficient and, and, and plan how you move it. And you definitely don't want to move it far if you can help it. But um, every time I prep a field, I just do a little bit of work. Um, grading it and filling in those low areas and moving soil around. And then after four or five years, end up having pretty good field. But it takes a while for sure. You have to have patience. 
You know, but that's that's an interesting way to do it, to kind of take that long view to say, over a period of time, we're going to really maximize the productive capacity here by slowly changing the landscape, rather than, say, just bringing in a bulldozer, which can be a, a whole mess in and of itself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a cost involved with that, and, and you know, planning it around your production schedule and timing it and all that could be an issue. But yeah, if you have your own equipment, you can kind of just do a little bit as you go every every now and then. And, and take the long view. When we talk about the layout on, you know, roads on the ridges and kind of, you know, gradual sloping away from that, the sort of this, the design aspects of your, of how you've laid out the farm, there's other things that you've taken into consideration with that too. I mean, that's kind of the focus of this, of the book that you wrote, the bio-integrated farm to about all of the different things you can do from a design standpoint to, to make your farm work better. And you do spend some time in there talking about road layout, field layout, building layout. What are some of the other pieces of of relatively low-hanging fruit, easy to get to stuff that doesn't take a whole lot of effort or a whole lot of money that farmers could be using on in their operations to enhance the efficiency of the operation from a biological standpoint? Yeah, I think um having a small rainwater harvesting pond or like a water garden on your farm is, is often overlooked design element um, that can be highly beneficial. Um, I haven't seen a lot of research that's studied these small water gardens, but um, I find that they become a, a great nexus for the toads and frogs that disperse into the landscape and, and control pests for you. And uh, it's kind of anecdotal evidence, but I've seen a drastic reduction in our pest population after building ponds. And you can basically uh, manage the ponds in a way where you can kind of promote those dispersing frogs and toads if you treat them as vernal ponds or if you drain them um, at some point during the year. And what that does is it gets rid of, I usually stock them with mosquito fish to control the mosquito population. And they become a great, basically, mosquito trap. If any mosquito lands on those ponds, it's going to get eaten. But um, okay. I drain the pond. It gets rid of the mosquito fish. And then that allows the frogs and the uh, and the tadpole, uh, the, the frogs and the toads to lay their eggs in there. The mosquito fish are usually predaceous on those eggs and those tadpoles. So without the mosquito fish, they can populate those ponds. And then, um, and then disperse in the landscape to give you pest control. So that's kind of the easy weekend project you can do and will give you a lifetime of pest control. <laughs> when you say easy weekend project, what's involved in, in putting in one of these, these vernal ponds? Um, I usually, you know, find a catchment surface, like a roof or a greenhouse, and then um, channel the water, or you can use to catch water off of a road or a parking area. And then it's just a matter of channeling the road, uh, the water through pipes or gutters or, um, diversion channels, which are like gutters in the landscape, and then you just channel the water into those ponds, um, and you want to basically size the pond based on the size of the catchment area, as well as the amount of rainfall that you get in your climate. So there's a little bit of engineering and planning that's involved, because you want to get the size of the pond right based on that catchment area. And then um, it's just a matter of digging it out. I use a, a box scraper to do all the digging for me, um, but there's a whole host of farm equipment you could use. You could probably use a loader to do it. Um, but if you have a box scraper or a rear blade and you pull the top link in all the way, um, you can use it as a digging device and actually dig ponds with it. So then after digging it, I, I usually um, will line it with a palm liner, and then I like to bury the palm liner with soil to protect it. And then soil on top of the palm liner also allows you to grow plants aquatic plants in that soil and then um just let the rains come and fill it up um nice sometimes to have different types of overflow systems or drain systems and then you can quickly and effectively drain the water out of those ponds um, you can use the water for irrigation if you tie it in with other uh, elements in your design but um yeah that's the basics of it it's a really interesting idea to, to be more intentional about, I mean, essentially what you're talking about is, is where the water's pooling. Um, and 
and you're not talking about a huge amount of water when you when you talk about these small ponds. I mean, how how big are we talking? Yeah, just you know, twenty by twenty feet is pretty effective. And again, you you noted there wasn't any research that you found about this, but how far have you observed the the effect the biological effects of that pond to go when you put in a twenty by twenty water surface? Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we used to not have frogs and toads on our farm, and now even thousands of feet from those ponds, <laughs> there'll be um, quite a few out in the fields and. I don't know what their fertilizer value is, but when you get the fields up, you're also <laughs> killing a massive amount and dipping it into the soil. So probably a small fertilizer value you get from them as well. Right. Kind of, a, <laughs> little. Kind of unfortunate, but um, I do see them all over the farm now. Um, so it's pretty quite amazing uh, how drastically uh, or how drastic that change can be. And, you know, one year you don't have them, next year you do. Now, one of the things that I've seen pictures of in your book and also online is is actually putting in one of these ponds on the south side of a greenhouse to help enhance how the greenhouse functions. Yeah, yeah, that was um, kind of an interesting design that we developed at the Student Organic Farm. We basically built our greenhouses on these sloped platforms, and the sloped platforms are a slope towards the south, um, which gives you a little more solar energy in the wintertime but it also allows us to very easily harvest the water that comes off the greenhouses. So the greenhouse is aligned actually with the, with the ridge pole going north-south rather than east-west. Yeah, and you could. I've done some sloped platforms with greenhouses on an east-west axis. Um, you just have to have a, a multi-sloped direction to your platform so that then you can get water around that backside and into the south side. But yeah, it works either direction. I mean, the best way to, to orient your greenhouses is, is in an east-west axis because you'll absorb more solar energy in the wintertime and less in the summer, which is what you want. But um, in our situation, we had a whole bunch of greenhouses and we wanted to place them really close together without shading them out. So um, a north-south axis kind of made more sense to us, even though we were um, losing a little bit of solar energy um, with that orientation. But it's it set up nicely with the, the ponds on the south side, and then we ended up putting some of those ponds, rainwater harvesting ponds, inside the greenhouses and designing the greenhouses to harvest water into those internal ponds. So let's let's talk about the external ponds first and what sort of an effect those have on, on your greenhouse management. Because the idea is to, is to increase the amount of light absorption during the low-light months of the year, right? Yeah, yeah. So in the wintertime, when the sun's low on the horizon, it's uh, reflecting off those ponds and into the greenhouse to give us more light and heat energy. And then um, we have, you know, water-filled barrels inside the pond that collect that reflected light and that heat gets stored in the water. Water acts as uh, it's called thermal mass. It absorbs that solar energy during the daytime and then releases that heat at night when you need it most. But one of the best benefits, I think, of having a sloped greenhouse is, is cooling you get a um you can basically get uh convection to help cool your greenhouse because you can separate your vents at a greater distance apart uh with a sloped greenhouse but you have a, a height difference of, of one foot between two four foot vents on either end of your sloped greenhouse um you can get a lot of convective uh basically convection pulling that heat out of your greenhouse. So it's basically the, it's having two four-foot vents on either side of a 45-foot greenhouse will move as much air as a 16-inch fan without having to run the electricity to run the fan. Simply because heat rises. Exactly, yes. You're taking advantage of that heat rising um, with the slope of the greenhouse. And okay. then you can also take advantage of... Um, moving heat through your greenhouse at night, too. If you have your thermal mass, your heat source at the lowest point in a sloped greenhouse, then the heat from that source is going to rise and then fall back down to that heat source. And you can actually use um, thermal mass at a low point to convectively pump heat through your greenhouse um, using, like, a convective loop. Could you maybe describe that convective loop a little bit? Yeah, so you have a sloped greenhouse. And then your uh, thermal mass, your heat source is at the lowest point in that sloped greenhouse. 
So then heat from that heat source rises to the top and then cools off and then falls back down to that low point. So it's just constantly rising and falling, and that helps move the heat through your greenhouse. And I would imagine that – so when you, well – so when you say convective loop, you're not really you're not talking about an additional piece of hardware. You're just talking about the way that air and and heat is moving through the greenhouse. Exactly. Yeah, we're just using design okay. to um, to move that heat. Okay. And and you're really not talking about a radical slope here. I mean, if you said one foot over forty five foot length of a, of a greenhouse, I mean that'd be two foot in a hunt two foot in a hundred or a, or a 2% slope. So not a real, you're not talking about any kind of radical sloping in the greenhouse. This is all pretty mild. Yeah. Yeah. I guess at the greenhouse at the farm, I mean, I wouldn't go more than a 2% slope, which is a two foot drop over a hundred feet. But at the greenhouse at the farm, we did a, um, a 1% slope, which is a one foot drop over a hundred feet. So yeah. It doesn't take much. One of the things that I've always wondered, you know, when, when you're looking at, at trying to integrate some of these systems on the farm, well, it's something I've oftentimes said to beginning farmers, you know, and, and I ripped this off from somebody, somebody else was talking about marketing, but I've always thought of it in, in terms of uh, farm systems, you know, that you can be a nudist or you can be a Buddhist, but you can't be a nudist Buddhist, you know, which is <laughs> a way of saying, you know, we're, we're already doing some stuff that's kind of weird and out there. You know, you're already trying to have an organic vegetable farm, right? That's already uh-huh. a little bit strange. You're trying to direct market produce in a world where where people aren't used to direct marketed produce. And now and now you're going to start adding these other layers on. I mean, I know that on my farm, we tended to go for the option of, of plugging in a propane heater rather than looking for how could we get more thermal mass and manage that with a pond that has to be drained. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about as you're describing these systems, I go like, wow, that's, you know, there's already enough stuff to think about. This is already, this is more stuff to think about. I'm kind of curious how you, how you handle that from a management standpoint. Yeah, basically, um, well, all the projects happen in the wintertime when we're not busy. So trying to find stuff to do basically during a cool cool time of year is, is when a lot of this stuff happens. And, you know, starts with an idea and then just take on that project um, when we have time. So kind and of I guess a, winter, winter in South Carolina is a little bit different than winter up here uh, in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. You can, you can actually get outside and move dirt at that time. Yeah, yeah, which makes it a little easier for us down here, I guess. And think about that. But And then really it's kind of putting in systems during the winter that are, are there and can function relatively autonomously during the summertime or during the growing season. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all the, the hardscaping gets done during the wintertime. And sometimes we'll do a little bit in the summertime because, you know, even here, the soil doesn't dry out during the wintertime, so it's hard to do soil during the wintertime. So, um, you know, like if you have any grading projects, a lot of times you have to do that during the summertime. And we take actually a month off during our summer production in August, just because it's so hot, it's difficult to work, and it's difficult to get produce to come in during August um, where we are. So, And we need to have more time to plant for our fall crops. So we take a month off that gives us some time to plant for fall crops and um, don't have to work as much in the heat. And then um, we can do, you know, a small project during that time as well. So kind of looping back to the to the greenhouse design then we talked about the pond on the on the outside sort of serving as a as a reflecting pond and then you talked about having the having a pond on the inside of the greenhouse which again I'm going like wow that seems a little bit crazy in terms of of how you're utilizing your space in that that very high value high you know high dollar covered space but can you talk about how that how that pond on the inside fits in both from a biological standpoint and economically? Yeah, it does cut your productive area down. Um, but um, yeah, we started experimenting with these ponds called shallow solar ponds and we built one and then I started researching it, which a lot of times happens after I start a project when ideally you do your research before you start a project. But um, people had had built these before, I guess, maybe back in the 70s. I can't remember exactly when. But the shallow solar ponds are basically, they act as thermal mass. They absorb that solar energy during the daytime and then re-radiate that heat at night. So with internal ponds, we insulate them. 
on the bottom so the heat from that water can't escape into the soil. Bilties tested them out, um, and they're pretty effective at heating greenhouses. They give you about 1,000 BTUs of, of heat every night on average during the wintertime, and that's a pond that's maybe 12 by 15 feet um, and a greenhouse that, you know, um, 45, actually 65 feet long. Yeah, it's basically free heat. 100,000 BTUs is a little more than one gallon of propane. Keeps the greenhouse about six and a half degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the greenhouses that don't have ponds in them, which is basically the equivalent of, you know, covering your vegetables with a row cover every day or every night and then pulling that row cover off. But, um, you know, with a pond, you don't have to, you get that heat without having to pull that row cover over and pull it off at night. So you can sacrifice the space. Um, it can save you time. And then to make those ponds more productive, uh, we ended up using them as nursery ponds for growing uh, fish and freshwater prawns. And then we have an aquaculture facility on campus with larger ponds. And then once our prawns or fish get to uh, size, um, then we transfer them to the bigger ponds where we can grow them out. So just like you're using the greenhouse as a transplant production, it's almost like you're using it as a transplant production for the prawns and the fish as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because you can grow a massive amount of small fish in a, in a small area, or you can grow a few larger fish in a small area. So it makes more economic sense to grow a whole bunch of very small fish and then grow those small fish out in bigger ponds. Okay. And is that is that larger aquaculture operation, is that part of the student organic farm, or is that something separate? Um, it's just a few thousand feet away, but it is separate, but it's close by, which is nice. I'm curious if you've ever seen those kinds of internal ponds being used up north or if that's if this is really something that's more applicable in an environment where you're not getting into a deep freeze in the wintertime. Yeah, I haven't seen them up north. The the research that was done on them um, about 20, 30 years ago, I think it was done in California. And then there was some modeling that was done on them as well. But yeah, I haven't seen them. I think that they would, they would work well um, in almost any climate. We actually put solar pool covers over the top of them. So one of the issues you can have with internal ponds inside of a greenhouse is you get a lot of evaporation and then condensation on your greenhouse. So it's important to cover them um, with something that prevents that evaporation, but that also increases the water temperature as well. So I think you get a little more heat gain with the, with the solar pool cover over your pond. Interesting. And, and it still lets the heat release at night so that it can serve as that heat source. Yep, exactly. Okay. And are you using the same kinds of principles for constructing those as you are uh, constructing the ponds outside? You know, digging them out, putting in a liner, adding soil over the top of that liner? Yeah, in the greenhouses we do uh, a slightly different. Um, I make the, the slope angles a little bit steeper. Um, and, and, and the green and the ponds inside the greenhouses, and that allows us to hold a little more water. And on some of those, we have actually vertical walls that we built out of um, blocks, uh, cinder blocks. And um, and then I don't put uh, soil on top of the liner. Um, I use a different liner product. I use an EPDM liner, which is a little bit thicker and more resistant to UV degradation. And then I don't put soil over the top of that um, for several reasons the black color of the liner can absorb more solar energy. So it heats up a little bit better, I believe. And then um, since we're re we also recirculate the water from those ponds through filtration systems and not having soil on top of them, um, you know, allows us to recirculate the water without clogging the filtration system. And that also makes it easier to harvest the, the fish out of there or the prawns out of there um, when we need to transport them. Um, if you have soil in there, you basically have to dig all those things out of the mud. But um, just having the liner allows us to get almost all the water out. And then um, it's a lot easier to scoop the fish up. Right, right. Almost kind of like draining your aquarium before you go in with the net to start going after the fish. Exactly, yes. It helps um, crowd them and, and make extraction easier. Yeah. Sorry, I just I just did that. We we moved the aquarium from one side of the living room to the other. So I've just just been in that. Process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know all about it. So um, that's my my little aquaculture project, if you will. So um, 
I'm well. So greenhouses, what what other kinds of things are you doing with the greenhouses in terms of a of a biointegration standpoint? What what other what other concepts have you integrated into that? Well, I think one of our most successful and interesting projects has actually been our compost heat extraction system. Um, we've been working on this for several years now, and, and we've developed um, several new systems to basically extract heat from the compost piles and then use that heat in the greenhouses. Um, and then we also use those ponds as, as heat storage batteries. So we can take heat out of the compost pile, um, put that heat into those, into those ponds, and then um, charge those ponds up with the, with the compost heat and then use those ponds as heat storage batteries. I can then heat because the greenhouses at night. Tell me a little bit about how that works, because I'm I'm imagining that you're not carrying the heat in buckets and pouring it <laughs> into the pond, right? No, no. Um, we actually have about can't, maybe four or five different techniques that we use. Um, one of them is similar to the Jean Payne technique, where um, we have a hydronic heating system that we use for our greenhouses for heat, and that's where you basically heat water and then you can pump that hot water to wherever you need the heat. So I like hydronic heating systems because instead of heating the entire greenhouse, you can just heat an individual bench. So it saves a lot of energy. Um, and then you can use one central heater for, to heat multiple greenhouses. So instead of buying, you know, a new heater for all for each greenhouse, you can just use that central heater and then pump the heat to the other greenhouses. Um, so one of our techniques uh, uses that hydronic heating system and similar to the Jean Payne technique, he basically, uh, Jean Payne built these giant round compost piles and then installed about 900 feet of, of pipe within those piles and then, um, ran the water through the piles and then the heat transfers into the water and then you can, um, pump that water or, or use that hot water wherever you need it. So our technique, um, instead of building giant round piles, we build, uh, windrow style piles, which are long, narrow piles. And with windrow piles, what happens is you get all this hot vapor that rises through the center of the pile and out the top. That hot vapor, as it rises, is pulling in um, air from the sides of the pile. But um, what I determined is that you can run um, a much smaller amount of pipe through your pile um, and still extract a large amount of heat as long as you run that pipe right through the the center of the windrow style pile, so you're tapping into that hot vapor that's rising. And then you can use less piping material. And with less piping material, um, it allowed us to develop a technique where we use the tractor to um, very quickly and easily extract the pipe um, if you want to turn the pile or if you want to um, uh, use the compost out in the field. So with less piping material, we're able to quickly get the pipes out and then or put and put the pipes back in. So tell me about how tell me about what kind of pipe you're using and and about the methods that you're using for getting that into the pile and, and out of it. Because I'm just I mean, I'm thinking about that and I'm going, this seems like a giant pain in the ass. No, I mean I can I have about a forty cubic yard pile, I can pull the pipes out, turn the pile, put the pipes back in in about an hour. So it's pretty, wow. pretty, pretty quick. Um, we get about, I mean, it's not a, a huge amount of, of energy. We get about $25 worth of heat for every hour that we spend on the, on the composting process. Um, but then you're also getting the compost at the end of the season too, which I don't even put a, a, a value price on. Um, that's just kind of like we're mainly going after the heat, but the compost is great too. So yeah, for the okay. piping, I use one inch PEX pipe and, uh, where it makes the turn at the very end of the compost pile, um, I put in two elbows, PEX elbows, and then to extract the pipe, I basically attach those PEX elbows to uh, a tow chain and then attach the tow chain to the tractor. And then um, if you pull on those uh, fittings instead of the pipe, you won't damage the pipe. And that allows you to rip the pipe out. And then I just use the front end loader um, to make a trench in the pile and then insert the pipe back in it and then use a front end loader to bury it again. Okay. Um, and then we have other techniques too, where we've um, embedded pipe. The easiest system 
which is a little more expensive, is we've embedded pipe inside of a concrete slab. And then we build our compost pile on top of the concrete slab, and then we run our hydronic water through the pipe inside the slab, and then heat trans the slab heats up, and then heat transfers into our water. And that's really easy because then you can just, you know, you don't have to worry about taking pipes in and out. And then um, we have another system that we use, um, which doesn't require pipes inside the pile. And with this system, we basically built a wall of 55-gallon drums um, along one wall of our greenhouse. And then the compost pile is built up against the wall of the greenhouse that has that, the 55-gallon drums forming the wall. And then we basically pump water from the ponds through those barrels and all the barrels are interconnected. And then those barrels basically extract heat from that compost pile into the water, which then goes back into the pond. And it's a little more complicated than that, but um, if you get the book, it uh, shows you some of the details. So um, each barrel is what's called a swirl separator. So as the water is getting passed through the barrels, it's also filtering the water, heating it, and then it forms the wall of the greenhouse. So those barrels are actually doing a lot of functions for us. And then I would guess that even though you're running water through them, that they end up also serving as, as some thermal mass that's re-radiating heat at night as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it, it heats that greenhouse pretty good as well. Um, just having a compost pile up against the wall of your greenhouse, well, actually, um, when we tested that out, kept that greenhouse about four degrees warmer than the greenhouse that didn't have um, the compost up against it. So and you when you say up against the wall, is is this up against the side walls or the end walls or both? Uh, um, it depends. I mean, it could be either. Um, ours is up against the side of the wall, of the side wall. Um, the one thing you do have to be concerned about when you attach a compost pile to a greenhouse is um, the compost gases. Because um, you're going to get compost gas leaking into that greenhouse, um, so which can be toxic to humans and plants at high concentrations. So you have to be careful to ventilate those greenhouses properly before you go into them. But we've also developed systems where we basically extract the compost gas from the compost piles and then inject that into the greenhouses um, through a filter. And the compost gas is very rich in carbon dioxide. And then if you increase the carbon dioxide content in your greenhouses, you can get about 30%. Um, more plant growth. You have to be careful to to ventilate the greenhouses before you go in them. So that's really interesting to me. You talked about putting in a filtration system then for the gases. So is it scrubbing the other, the the more poisonous stuff out? Or Yeah, it, it, it helps take some of the toxic stuff out like ammonia and um, hydrogen sulfide. But basically, yeah, we just pass the compost gas through uh, two feet of finished compost. And then that finished compost helps filter out those pollutants. But it doesn't do a perfect job, so we have like CO2 uh, meters where we can check the CO2 concentrations, and I'm always careful to ventilate the greenhouses before we go in them. You know, again, it seems like something that, that adds a layer of management, but when you're talking about a four-degree temperature increase, that's not insignificant at certain times of the year. Yeah, I mean, and it's free heat, and so, yeah, a lot of the things, you know, I mean, a lot of people are composting already. It's just a matter of, you know, connecting your compost pile to your greenhouses. So it could be something that you're already doing, but maybe you're not, you know, uh, getting as much benefit from that component in your farm as, as you could be. So, you know, if you're extracting heat from it, then, then that's another benefit. And then if you're extracting carbon dioxide from it, then that compost pile is really working for you at that point. Right. And plus you got compost. Yep. Yep. And then the compost. Exactly. Great. All right. So with that, we're going to we're going to take a break now, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. Great. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant material, heat, labor, and overhead depends absolutely on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do. Produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients that I could to make my own potting soil, and later on finding cheap potting soil already put together. But I found that what so many farmers have, that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. 
Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story of customers who switch to less expensive options, but who have come back to Vermont Compost for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. And even though it's not all about saving money, Vermont Compost's pre-buy program can help you get what your plants need at the best price, with the best shipping options, delivered at a time that works best for you. Plus, their Shared Truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that gets shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Feed the soil. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by FarmFan. Most farmers market customers only visit the market two or three times per season, and there are plenty who make it less often. Market dates simply get forgotten in the wash of soccer games, brunch dates, commuting, and other commitments that keep would-be market customers from becoming regular market shoppers, not to mention the challenges to your customers of knowing when market season begins and ends or keeping them on schedule for irregular winter markets. FarmFan lets you send a text message reminder to all of your customers, taking the detect fork out of the equation. Plus, you can let customers know what you'll have at market that day, and even offer your FarmFan special deals to increase the number of market customers who come specifically to see and buy from you. Unlike emails and social media, text messages are always on. 98% of text messages actually get read compared to 25% of emails and as little as 4% for some social media channels. Who doesn't check their phone when it buzzes? Visit the show notes page for this episode or the sponsor page at farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash sponsors for 25% off your 6 or 12 month subscription to FarmFan. Turn your well-meaning occasional shoppers into regulars and create a following. FarmFanApp.com. All right, and we're back with Sean Yodnicek from the Clemson University Student Organic Farm. So, Sean, we were talking about compost and and building these piles up against the greenhouse as as a way to actually provide heat to the greenhouse. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about your your actual composting process? Yeah, sure. Um, we uh, get food delivered to the farm from which comes from the cafeterias on campus. And it comes in these rolling trash cans, weigh about 125 pounds. And we take that, that food waste material and we dump it into our front end loader. And then we dump our front end loader into a manure spreader. And then in that manure spreader, we mix uh, the food waste with wood chips. We do about two parts wood chips for every one part food waste. And we layer that in the manure spreader. and then. The manure spreader is a PTO-driven spreader, so we just basically back that up wherever we need the compost, and then that um, mixes the ingredients very well and spits it out the back. Um, before we, we were using the manure spreader, we would just layer the compost ingredients, but we realized that we weren't getting very high temperatures, and we were getting a lot of odor issues as well um, because the piles are getting anaerobic. But the manure spreader has really been a game changer for us. It's allow us to do more composting because we can very quickly make those piles and, and make them without smells and get the temperatures up high. But that manure spreader is also great in putting the compost back out into the field. But what's even more important than that is using it as a, as a mulching device. So we'll take, um, I get leaves delivered from the city of Clemson um, in the fall and I stockpile a massive amount of leaves, and then I can use that manure spreader um, to put that leaf mulch out in my field um, for mulching different plants. And it's, and it's really quick and effective. I can put about six inches of leaf mulch over a third of an acre in about four hours using the manure spreader. And that's a, that's a pre-plant process, right? Pre and post-plant. So, for example, it works great with garlic. Um, I'll usually bed, you know, make my bed, plant the garlic, and then uh, just before the garlic emerges or just after the garlic emerges, I'll, I'll cover that area with six inches of leaves and the garlic will push through. And then with some crops like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, especially peppers and, and eggplant, we do those on, on, with organic no-till. So we grow up a winter cover crop and then we use a roller crimper to basically terminate that cover crop and it leaves the, the cover crop on the soil surface as a, as a thick mulch. And then we'll plant our, our peppers and eggplants um, through that mulch and then um, drive the manure spreader um, over it. And we'll add a layer of leaves on top of that crimped cover crop. 
and that will give us uh, season-long weed control. Um, if we just use the, the crimp cover crop um, without the leaves on top, it only gives you maybe one or two months of weed control. But by adding that extra layer of leaves, you get season-long weed control. Okay, so that that's a that's kind of a nice a nice solution to that perennial problem that that I think we run into with the with the no-till cover cropping systems where you know if you have a thin stand or or if you know if your biological activity is really high you can end up at the end of the year getting a weed flush yeah yeah you get that weed flush and then i'm also actually experimenting right now with um using the leaf mulch for early termination and i i think that at least with ryegrass um you can terminate it before you know, normally you have to terminate the ryegrass with the roller crimper um, when it's uh, when it's very mature. But um, if you add a layer of leaves to the to the top of it, you can actually terminate it um, much earlier than you would normally terminate it. Keeps it from popping back up. Yeah, that's a new field that we're just exploring. Now you must be dealing with a whole whale of a lot of leaves. Yeah, it's a pretty massive pile. But um, I actually should have gotten more. I had to turn them away because I didn't have have room to store them. Um, but I got to find a new spot to store them. And I mean, it's so easy to put it out with a manure spreader. I really need to be doing more of it. I think this is a nice spot to kind of segue into the actual farming that you're doing there at the student organic farm. So you've got this, you've got six acres in production. Can you describe your, your production system to us? Yeah, I try to do as much transplanting as possible. Gives us, you know, head start on the growing season and head start on the weeds, um, I uh, plant everything on raised beds. Um, cover cropping is our main fertilizer source, but we also um, make up for some fertilizer needs with um, blood meal and with cottonseed meal. And let's see, I've got a whole host of planting and cultivation equipment. I use a um, cultivation toolbar that has spider wheels, side knives, sweeps. Um, and S times on it, and I use that to do most of our cultivation. And so when you say toolbar, on, that's on the back of the tractor, right? Yes, on the back of the tractor. Um, and then we also use collinear hose. Uh, collinear hose is probably one of my favorite tools. Um, but we'll use that for a little bit of cultivation. Each raised bed, we either do a single row, a double row, or a triple row. Um, and then our cultivation equipment is designed around our, our spacing on those beds. Um, we see, we use a, we just got a water wheel transplanter and, um, we use that for marking the rows and fisting and transplanting. Um, our bed shaper also has a drip tape applicator on it. So we can hook our drip tape up to our bed shaper and then that will bury our drip tape, um, which has been a huge time saver for us. And it's also allowed us to do more flame weeding and flame weeding is a really important uh, strategy we use for weed control. Um, we do a lot of stale seed bedding where we'll, you know, let a flush of weeds come up and then we'll do shallow cultivation um, with a flame weeder or with our cultivation equipment um, to kill those weeds um, without stirring up weeds from deeper in the soil. Um, and that really knocks down a lot of our, our weed problems. We also, also do delayed planting where you know, we'll let a rain come, get a flush of weeds going, and then maybe wait four or five days before we plant our seed so that the weeds come up first. And then we'll flame weed over the top of those, kill the weeds, but our seeds are protected under the soil. Um, see, what else do we use? We've got um, a chain drag, which I use for stale seed bedding, shallow cultivation. And that's just like a, that's kind of like a chain link fence sort of a thing that just drags across the top of the bed, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and I started stale seed bedding before I even plant my cover crops in the fall, which gives us, um, you know, better stand of cover crops with less weed pressure in them. And I actually started planting all, all of our cover crops on raised beds, which has really been helpful. Um, so all of our winter cover crops go on raised beds. Um, and our roller crimper seems to work fine on those raised beds, um, crimping and killing those cover crops. But um, planting up the cover, the winter cover crops on raised beds gives us um, 
earlier maturing winter cover crops in the spring. Um, they grow fast. Yes, they grow faster. They grow denser. You actually have more surface area too when you plant on a raised bed. Um, so you actually can get more cover crop material out there. And um, and then I think it's the soil temperature gets increased with the raised beds, and then better soil drainage um, gives you better cover crop growth. And when you say you're you're planting it on the raised beds, how high are your raised beds? Um, they're about six inches. Six inches over the wheel tracks. So that's actually a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty radical difference. And, and you're saying that, that then when you come in to terminate that cover crop, is it getting everything that's in the wheel tracks and in the beds? Um, with the roller crimper? Yeah. Yeah, the roller crimper. Um, I guess the tires, you know, the, the roller crimper only is getting the top of the raised bed. But um, I guess the tires provide enough pressure to terminate the cover crop in the wheel well area. <laughs> so. The original roller crimper, right? Exactly. Um, exactly. So if you, th- if you think about it, they're actually pretty similar design. Um, that's interesting. So when you're when you're seeding the cover crop, how are you doing that? Is that with a seed drill or are you guys uh, going out with a whirlybird seeder and putting it on? Yeah, well, um, Actually, we have an overseeder, but now that we're planting our cover crops on raised beds, I need to sell the overseeder because we're not even using it anymore. Um, I actually just use, I've got a whirly bird seeder, like a, one of those cone spreaders. But I find that if you want to do crimping with your cover cropping, you really have to be precise with how much seed you're putting out. Um, so I actually do most of our seeding with a, just a bag seeder um, strapped over our shoulder. Takes probably a good day to put it out over, you know, five, six acres, but um, you get a very precise application rate. Interesting. I, I always felt like I got a less precise application rate with, with the, because of the human factor when you're, oh, when you've yeah, got something yeah. you're putting over your shoulder. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want, it could just be that I haven't dialed in the whirly bird theater yet. I probably should switch to that. It would take a lot of time. Talk to me a little bit about about using that the the over the shoulder bag seeder as a way to get stuff on and how you get how you get that consistent year after year. Yeah, you know I um, calibrate it, or if I have a student do it, I have a student um, calibrate it themselves so that they know exactly how many pounds you're putting out per acre. Um, I've been growing a, a cover crop combination of um, ryegrass mixed with uh, crimson clover. Both of them mature kind of at the same time for rolling and crimping if you want to do that. But, um, yeah, I just usually make the raised beds, um, use the bag seeder to apply the seed, and then I take the bed shaper back over those raised beds. Um, and then by running the bed shaper back over the, the raised beds, it helps incorporate those seeds um, and press the soil down a little bit, too, to give you better seed to soil contact. I think that's a really great suggestion about about making those beds ahead of time and thinking about that as part of your your cover crop management strategy because it totally makes sense. If raised beds are good for vegetables, they ought to be good for cover crops as well. Yeah, and then if we have a um, really wet spring, um, the raised beds can help us get into the fields earlier if we're doing um, uh, tillage. Because what I can do is I can just uh, use a flail mower to mow the cover crop down forgot to mention that tool, flail mower is critically important. But I'll take the flail mower in, um, mow as close to the ground as I can on top of those beds, and then I just bring in um, a rototiller and just rototill real shallow on the tops of those beds. Um, so because I'm not cultivating, or, you know, I'm not doing any deep tillage, um, the tops of those beds dry out really quickly, and that allows you to get into the fields earlier. And when you're when you're terminating the cover crops that way, rather than using the roller crimper, there, what are you doing about the cover crop that's in the wheel tracks? Uh, yeah, that that does become problematic because the flail mower, you know, can't mow everything close to the ground. Um, can't mow the cover crops and the wheel tracks close to the ground. Um, so, yeah, if you're, you know, eventually you're going to have to drive back over those. Um, to kill them, but how did that work this year? I ended up coming through with cultivation equipment um, with sweeps, um, and the sweeps are stout enough to basically come in and 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 cultivate the cover crops that were in the wheel tracks. 
um, when I'm just tilling the tops of the bed. Otherwise, if, uh, if it's dry enough to till the whole field without tilling the tops of the bed, then what I'll do is I'll just mow it down and then bring the disc harrow in and just do, you know, basically you're destroying the beds at that point. Right. Right. Okay. And, and are your raised beds more or less permanently located or are you re rebuilding and reshaping those in a different spot every year? Yeah, they're, I'm rebuilding them every year. I've, I've thought about trying to get a permanent bed in there, but it's, it's difficult to do. So then on the, on the farm, um, I, you're working largely with a labor force of students, I assume. Yes. Yep. We hire all students, um, uh, working at the farm. It's, got its uh, blessings and, and its curse. As soon as you get a student trained, they're usually graduating and gone at that point. Um, so it's, it's hard to, to keep people around for a long period of time, but constantly, you know, trying to get students first or second year, they get there and then give them raises every year so they stick around because it is, it is tough work. But um, I have some really good students at the farm now, and it's always awesome when you when you have some good workers out there but um yeah it can be difficult especially during the school year um, during the summertime labor isn't really an issue i usually keep four students on and um keep them around for 28 hours a week but um during the school semester it's very difficult to get the labor that you need so um you know i'll probably have nine students that maybe work two to four hours a week during the during the school semester. Some of them might work a little bit longer, but it's split up between a lot more people and I have to bring in a lot of students that, that don't have the training that complicates things. But um, we've kind of worked around that by trying to mechanize things as much as possible so that we're not um, completely dependent upon a large labor force. Yeah, I think it's always a funny dynamic with the, the any kind of a student farm. I mean, on the one hand, you have a ready source of relatively inexpensive labor. But on the other hand, that availability can be so spotty that that, that mechanization almost becomes an imperative. Yeah. Yeah. It's been extremely helpful. And yeah, just, you know, adding a few key pieces of equipment have really enabled us to to keep our production level pretty high. And then you've got a a pretty much a built-in market there at Clemson University, right? Your, your CSA shares are primarily going, I assume, to folks that, that work on campus. Yeah, yeah, we uh, tailor it to, you know, community members, students, um, faculty, staff, um, so it runs the gamut, but um, yeah, since we're right on campus, it's really easy for people to, to just come to the farm to pick up their produce, which saves us a lot of time because we're not boxing shares and then delivering things, um, so we do cafeteria style where everyone just comes to the farm, and I think that gives them a, a really good um, farm experience where they get to actually see the produce growing and um, and then they box their own uh, their, their own produce. And then we also let them participate in part of the harvesting um, when it comes to like cut flowers, things that they enjoy to harvest. Um, so we have them harvest their own cut flowers and then um, things that take us forever to harvest, like cherry tomatoes, we'll have them harvest cherry tomatoes as well. And it saves us a lot of time. And when you say cafeteria style, are you dictating what people are choosing for their shares or are folks coming in and, and selecting the items that they're interested in and that they want? No, we, we tell them how much they can take of each item because um, that's important. So we know exactly how much to harvest and we want everyone to get the, the same share. But yeah, it just comes out of the coolers and we put it on tables and then we've got um, little chalkboards next to each item where we tell them, you know, what it is and how much they can take. And we've got like a big whiteboard where we also put on there how much um, each share gets. And then um, lots of like scales all around so they can weigh things out. And then I try to like cut back on rubber bands and um, because, you know, when you have to do a hundred bunches of something, you have to do maybe three or four bunches per pickup. You're going through quite a bit of rubber bands and it takes a lot of time. So, we actually will like count kale leaves and then our customers come in and they'll count kale leaves when they box their, their, their um, produce up and we don't have to do any um, bunching. That seems like an important adaptation to having a lot of workers on your farm who each work just a few hours, you know, rather than being able to, to get a, a really skilled labor force. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely helps. I'm trying to 
make things as efficient as possible and, you know, allowing the CSA customer to do as much work, I guess, as they can tolerate. You mentioned that you had some other markets in addition to your 100 CSA shares. Where else are you guys selling your produce? So there's a, a grocery store um, in Greenville, which is pretty close by. Um, we distribute a lot of produce to them. Uh, we also have like an online marketplace um, that we sell produce through. And then we have someone that does that resells our produce at a local farmer's market as well. And I'm curious on your six acres of produce on this on the student farm, how much how much produce are you guys actually putting out a year? Do you have a dollar figure that you can share with us? Yeah, we count I mean, we're giving our, our customers a pretty good deal. It depends on the year, of course. Last year I mean we did, we have numbers. I don't know them off the top of my head, but you know, we have two fourteen week seasons. Um our spring summer season last year, our customers got about thirty six dollars uh, and produce every week. Um, and then they're paying $25 a week for that produce. So that was like retail prices, retail value. Sean, if, if we were to kind of take what we've talked about from the production and the marketing and the, and the greenhouses and the roads and kind of everywhere that we've been in our conversation today, how would you, how would you kind of tie all that back in together? Yeah. You know, having a good design and a good plan is, and one of the most important things I think a farm can do um, to maintain profitability, you know, having roads that stay dry, placing those roads in the right places, um, having fields that, you know, drain so they're not susceptible to, to flooding, um, irrigation systems that are automated so you're not spending all your time watering, um, buildings that are close together so that um, you're not spending all your time moving between things. and you know, greenhouses that heat themselves don't require a lot of energy and money to, to keep going. All right. And so with that, then I'd like to turn to our lightning round. So, Sean, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Oh, probably the collinear hoe. I know it's Elliot Coleman's favorite tool as well. Um, but it's just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just wonderful and simple. Um, even though, you know, we're a large farm, we have tractor-drawn cultivation equipment, um, we're still using collinear hoe um, for a lot of crops. And it's just wonderful, simple, effective. Love teaching students how to use it. I think it's, it is a fun tool to teach because it's such a revelation because it's not when, when you attach the word hoe to something and then you hand them, you hand them that tool – this lightweight, long-handled tool with the very thin blade, it's not what they're expecting. Yeah, it isn't. And it's, and I guess it gets to the core fundamentals of weed control. You know, you need to control those weeds when they're small um, for, you know, weeding to be effective. And so it's, it's a great learning tool as well. What will you be doing differently on your farm this year? Well, We've got some new tools, some new pieces of equipment. Um, our water wheel transplanter and our drip tape applicator has been saving us a lot of money. Uh, we're also using blood meal now as a fertilizer because we got a good deal on that. And then um, we're experimenting with, you know, using leaf mulch uh, more than we have in the past and just expanding our, our no-till production as much as possible. And the best advice you've ever gotten? Don't give up. <laughs> I like that. So probably pretty important in, when you're trying to do something as ambitious from a design perspective as you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, constantly, you know, always the opportunity to give up and you just have to keep battling on and finding a way to succeed. All right. And what's your favorite crop to grow? Hmm. Favorite crop to grow? Probably winter squash, um, like butternut, delicata, uh, acorn squash. All the winter squashes are my favorite. Um, right now we're growing them uh, completely using no-till techniques, and they, are, they work very well with no-till techniques because they grow very quickly and um, basically smother any weeds that would potentially grow as that uh, no-till mulch breaks down. So, I mean, it's so simple. We basically put the plants in the ground and then come back and harvest. <laughs> it's that simple. It's pretty amazing. 
so you're you're rolling down your ryegrass and and crimson clover cover crop, then, mm-hmm. and and then are you you're transplanting the squash plants out into the field? Yep, and then we transplant the squash plants into the field. Um, you know, we run drip lines out there over the rolled cover crop, and then come back and harvest. It's pretty simple. Wow, that's that's kind of nice. Yeah, that's amazing. I always feel like I'm cheating nature when I grow those crops. <laughs> All right. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Oh, when you do something new, start small. And learn from your mistakes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Sean, it's been a lot of fun to have you on the show today. I really appreciate your making the time. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It's been great. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again, this is episode 66 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for the show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Yadnicek. You like how I said just searching for Yadnicek? That's spelled J-A-D-R-N-I-C-E-K, or you could just search for 066, which might be a little easier. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you'd enjoy the accompanying email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or at my other website, purplepitchfork.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to a growing circle of listeners. I also appreciate so much all the guest suggestions that I received through the contact form on farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Please let me know who you would like to hear from. I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.